Good morning. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for streaming with us. In today's update, AstraZeneca is preparing to apply for FD FDA emergency use authorization after revealing promising results from its phase three trial. The results show the vaccine is 79% effective against symptomatic COVID-19 and 100% effective at preventing hospitalization. The findings come after more than a dozen countries, mostly in Europe, temporarily suspended the vaccine over concerns about possible side effects. But the trial found no increased risk of blood clots in its 20,000 test subjects. We'll have more on what this all means in a moment. We're seeing new images from inside facilities holding migrant children in U.S. custody. Congressman Henry Cuellar provided these photos saying they were taken over the weekend. Unaccompanied minors have been crossing the border into the United States in record numbers, overwhelming border patrol resources and holding facilities. More than 15,000 children are now in federal custody. The number of them held for more than 10 days in facilities not meant for kids has skyrocketed, a five-fold increase in the last week. And jury selection is nearly complete in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former Minneapolis police officer accused of killing George Floyd. The judge says they will try to seat two more jurors in addition to the 13 already seated. Three of those jurors would then be alternates. ABC News Live will have gavel-to-gavel -gavel coverage of the Chauvin trial once testimony begins. That's scheduled to start next Monday, March 29th, right here on ABC News Live. Well, let's go back to that breaking news on the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine. That new trial data not only shows high efficacy against symptomatic COVID and hospitalizations, but also that the vaccine offered strong protection for older people. So what could this mean for global confidence in the vaccine and potential approval here in the U.S.? Director of the Jenner Institute at Oxford University, Professor Adrian Hill, is here to tell us more about it. Professor Hill, thanks so much for being here. We appreciate your time. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, so good morning or good afternoon to you, I suppose. So this phase three uh, data from Oxford AstraZeneca's U.S. trial shows some really promising results. Can you kind of translate them for those of us who aren't scientists? What do these numbers really mean from a practical standpoint? Thank you. Well, the most important number there is the 100 percent efficacy against severe COVID hospitalization and death that confirms a European trial that was also partly done in Brazil, uh, showing 100% efficacy against that most important endpoint. But the other number, the 79, 80% 80 efficacy is important too against clinical COVID. And as you mentioned, particularly in the older adults, where until now we had to rely really on surveillance data from the vaccine in deployment, where the efficacy looks very high in older adults. But now we have those data in a clinical trial. And as so, well. so this is really ticking the boxes and uh, completing the story. So, how does the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine compare to the other vaccines like the Pfizer, the Moderna, and the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? Yeah, well, the best way to compare, of course, is to do a head-to-head, -head, and that's been happening in these effectiveness studies in the UK, where really you can't pull them apart. They're both well over 80% effective, even with a single dose. So I don't think we need to worry about efficacy of these uh, excellent vaccines. Uh, we're, we're there on, on that. The issues now are safety and, and supply. And so let's talk safety, because we did recently see some countries stop using the AstraZeneca vaccine because of concerns over side effects, the main one being blood clots. What's the latest on that, and what do you hope uh, comes of this new data now that you have? Yeah, well, the latest is, of course, the European Medicines Agency, representing 27 European countries, looked very carefully at this last week and came to the conclusion that there was no higher incidence of thrombosis in the vaccinees compared to the controls. And that's clearly true on a, a lot of data that's been reviewed. There is some residual question that's being looked about at about a very, very rare uh, complication that's seen in maybe one in a million people. Very difficult to tell if that's anything to do with the vaccine, as the agency said. But their clear advice was carry on vaccinating. The use of the vaccine vastly outweighs any potential risk, given the benefit of preventing COVID with, with high efficacy. All right. So now the big question is when? When will you apply for emergency use authorization here in the U.S.? And if that's granted, how big of an impact do you think that could have on trying to get this country vaccinated? 
Yeah, well, that will happen in the, in the next few weeks. We heard this morning from AstraZeneca, who are really moving on this. Then it's up to the FDA to analyze the data and hopefully give approval. The reason it's kind of urgent is there are a lot of doses sitting around ready for use in the U.S. I heard the number 30 million would be available on day one from AstraZeneca this morning, 50 million in the first week, and then something, sorry, in the first month, and then something like 15 million doses a month from then on. So that would be a useful top-up to what's going on already, particularly when you remember, remember that this vaccine is stored in a regular refrigerator and very, very easy to deploy compared to, say, RNA vaccines. Now that will make a big difference. Professor Adrian Hill of Oxford University, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us today. We appreciate it. Pleasure. Thank you. And the NCAA is making some upgrades for the Women's March Madness Tournament after facing backlash over a viral TikTok video. Now that video posted by a female player shows the stark contrast between the men's weight room and the women's weight room, or lack thereof. Well, now the whole thing is prompting a larger conversation about the different treatment given to men's teams versus women's teams. Eva Pilgrim has more. This morning, following a major backlash and calls of blatant inequality. Guess what, guys? We got a weight room, yeah! The NCAA upgrading the weight room for the student athletes at the Women's March Madness Tournament. The weight room installed after University of Oregon forward Sedona Prince posted a TikTok video that went viral. This is our weight room. Let me show you all the men's weight room. That video now viewed more than 7 million times, igniting instant criticism. Stanford coach Tara Vandeveer tweeting, this cannot continue to be business as usual. Going on to write, women athletes and coaches are done waiting, not just for upgrades of a weight room, but for equity in every facet of life. South Carolina coach Don Staley says the disparities are glaring. No, we shouldn't be happy with just getting the bare minimum. If the men got a tournament off, and they're rolling out the red carpet for them, then that's our expectation. The NCAA responding. I care about women's basketball and women in sport. Um, we fell short this year. But it's not just the weight room. The COVID tests, different for the men's tournament, the more accurate PCR tests at the women's, antigen test. The NCAA saying that both forms of testing were equally effective models. And another major complaint, the food. This video getting nearly 4 million views. It looks like we got some kind of meat here. The NCAA says it immediately addressed the issue with the hotels and spoke with teams about finding more flexible food options. Another complaint, a quick look at the official March Madness Twitter account. The bio reads, the official NCAA March Madness destination for all things Division I NCAA men's basketball. No mention of the women's tournament. And South Carolina coach Don Staley tweeting this blistering statement. How do we explain that to our players? How can an organization that claims to care about all member institutions, student athlete experiences, have a copyrighted term that only represents one gender? And I want you to know, I checked the official March Madness Twitter again this morning. The bio is the same. Still no mention of the 64 women's team participating in this tournament. Diane. Yeah, incredible. Eva Pilgrim, thanks for that. Let's bring in USA Today sports columnist and ABC News contributor Christine Brennan for more on this. Christine, good morning. You know, so many of us seeing this video were shocked at the difference in the men's weight room versus the women's weight room. But you seem less surprised. In your latest column, you write that March Madness might as well be called spring sexism. Why? Yeah, because this has been going on for a long time. And while it is about the weight room in the sense, or the lack thereof, as Eva said, because, of course, that's the news right now, it's really, it's so deep-seated, Diane. It, it, the, the fact is uh, that it's called the final four, not the men's final four, uh, to show respect and also to be correct that there's a woman's final four. Uh, the, the use of the term bracket singular. Of course, there are two brackets, uh, men's and women's, the use of the word tournament even, uh, and when there are two tournaments. It, it is so ingrained in our society that I don't even know that people who, who are so supportive of women otherwise vote for women, you know, believe women can do anything. I think they kind of just during these three or four weeks just forget that women play sports. It's truly uh, amazing, but this has been going on for decades. 
the good news is now it's bubbled to the surface, and at least we're talking about it. I find it interesting because we're talking about very concrete things that these videos are highlighting. It's not just, you know, paying more attention to one team over the other or the way certain phrasing is made, but you're looking at a weight room versus what is really not a weight room, the quality of food, the types of COVID-19 tests. Now, Title IX was created to ensure more equal opportunities for men and women in college sports. So why isn't that making a difference here? Great question. You would think it would, right? And you think, okay, the NCAA has to follow Title IX guidelines. They should, uh, and the universities are supposed to, and the universities are member institutions of the NCAA. But uh, actually, in terms of uh, anger, which is out there right now, Diane, as you know, people are furious. Hey, sue the NCAA. I talked to the, the top Title IX labor uh, lawyer, uh, a lawyer on this issue, uh, Nancy Hogshead Maycar, and she told me that you can't sue the NCAA, and here's why. Title IX is all about federal funding. If a university gets federal funding, it has to be in compliance with Title IX, the law that opened the floodgates for women and girls in our country to play sports. Almost every university in the, in the country gets federal funding. That's why Title IX is so pervasive. The NCAA does not get federal funding. So as she said, Nancy Hawk said, Makar said, you cannot sue, the, a, a student athlete couldn't sue the NCAA. They could sue the universities. And in fact, she said uh, over the last six months, there have been dozens of these kinds of lawsuits by female student athletes against their universities for all the inequities. But it's not driven to the NCAA. You cannot make this a legal argument because of the federal funding issue. Got it. Now, you said that one good thing coming of this is that this conversation is now bubbling to the top. So do you think this time this conversation could lead to some change and help bring more equal opportunity in sports? I certainly hope so, Diane. You know, this has been something that I have been talking about, writing about for gosh, 30 years or so. And you, these watershed moments like the 99 Women's World Cup that I'm sure all of your viewers remember, and Brandi Chastain, Mia Hamm, et cetera, you know, that, we thought that was it. And it was in so many ways in terms of the nation falling in love with what we've created because of Title IX. Now of another generation, that's 20, what, 21 years ago, 22 years ago, another generation now coming along and we see this and it's just unacceptable. And that's why this is resonating. That's why this is such a big story over the last few days. University presidents could take care of it immediately if they want to. I think there will be more pressure on university presidents to take care of their own universities. We may even see Congress get involved with hearings or some kind of a bill. Uh, makes sense. Why wouldn't you want to take on something this popular and have that be associated if you're a member of Congress or a senator? Um, and, you know, I think, again, these lawsuits by students, we may see more. But there's power in numbers. And I think there's a kind of critical mass feeling here that this is something um, that is maybe bigger than, than, well, certainly bigger than a, a couple of dumbbells and, and weights. And now the question is, will there be action? Uh, this certainly, there's never going to be a bigger spotlight on women's sports uh, than there is right now over these next few weeks of the men's and the women's Final Four in the tournament. And what do you think that action looks like? What concrete things need to be done to help bring about the kind of change you're talking about? You know, the NCAA could do something like hiring someone or putting someone in charge to do literal quality control and say, what do the men have? What do the women have? Because clearly that fell through the cracks. Uh, that's very simple internally at NCAA headquarters to just make sure they're doing the little things right uh, and the big things. I'd also say, suggest the NCAA immediately change its trademark and no longer trademark Final Four, but add the word men's Final Four. They should change their Twitter account that Eva was talking about and make it men's and women's. Uh, words, it might seem small, but the idea of adding that word men's, the pesky adjective men's in front of tournament or basketball, uh, I think means a lot. It shows the respect for women and frankly, news organizations. We all need to better do a better job of saying the word tournaments, plural, uh, or brackets, plural, versus just, oh, I'm, I'm doing my bracket, which of course is implied that it's the men's, like the women are some little stepchild over in the corner. And those days should be over. So the media, all of us, I think, need to do a better job. Uh, but the NCAA certainly can lead the way with just some oversight that they clearly did not have in this case. We do. We can all pay a little more attention to all of these things. Christine Brennan, thanks so much. Always great to talk to you. Same here, Diane. Thank you. And many of us have spent a lot of the past year in the digital space, whether it's on Zoom calls for school or work to catch up with loved ones or occasionally to binge on our favorite shows during lockdowns. But what is all this screen time doing to our brains, especially for children? Here's Rena Roy. These days, screen time seems to be all the time. 
Non-stop stimulation in an infinite virtual playground. What's up? Hey, how you doing? Man? Everything has been kind of transformed to this 2D world. In our brains on screens, it's an addiction. The most susceptible among us, kids. 11-year-old Ion Mukherjee got his first computer when he began remote learning last spring. Let's just start from the beginning. Let's go back to April 2020 when virtual learning began. You got your very first laptop. What was that like? I mean, it was very exciting because I usually had to like share devices with people in my family. But he says in just a matter of days, things were getting out of hand. I started with a couple of videos, then I started watching more and more. I watched every free moment I had and day and night. And it turns out our brains are wired to keep watching. Binging activates the reward center found in the midbrain where dopamine is released and sent to our nucleus accumbens in the basal ganglia. It taps into the more survival and pleasure-based centers of the brain, driving us to watch that next episode or just one more video from a creator we love on YouTube. The prefrontal cortex of the brain, more recently evolved in humans, is more rational and works to weigh the consequences of certain decisions like binging. It might step in to tell the brain that you need sleep, so you should probably turn that video off. It's a constant battle between immediate pleasure and self-control, making us pretty exhausted. Dr. Heather Berlin, a neuroscientist and clinical psychologist, says it's taking a toll, particularly on kids. Studies show that with children, the longer amount of time they spend on screens, the worse their social and emotional development. Ayan's mother, Dr. Prithika Mukherjee, is a neuropsychologist herself and tells us she noticed an immediate shift in his behavior, saying he was extra tired, moody, and irritable. And as a mom during that shift, how did it feel to see your son kind of acting out in this way? It was hard. It was difficult because he's usually not this dysregulated. He's a very even keel, calm kid. We were questioning what could it be. According to the Mayo Clinic, excessive screen time in kids has been linked to loss of social skills, behavioral problems, less sleep or irregular sleep, obesity, and even violence. Lindsay Reckler, a mother of two, has been working and parenting from home like millions of Americans for over a year now. When you're fully plugged in, you lose a little bit of sense of boundaries. You really just ends up immersed in this screen of images and work. She's had to balance her own screen time as a busy director at an investment bank with that of her young children learning from home. We went from don't take mom and dad's iPad to here's your own and taking that iPad away after that virtual session is over proved to be very difficult. Especially as the internet became the vital link to the outside world. They went from interacting with every day, going to the playground, seeing their friends, to just pure isolation in our home. Dr. Berlin says that in person, our brains subconsciously pick up on cues like body language and touch to help us respond appropriately in social settings. But on platforms like Zoom, these cues are missed and the brain adjusts to a digital world of disrupted conversations, exaggerated expressions and a lack of eye contact. This is not how we were evolved to communicate, causing what's now being dubbed Zoom fatigue. Professor Jeremy Balenson has been leading Stanford University's research on the subject. Zoom fatigue is when you've been doing it for hours a day, you get this kind of exhaustion, you feel drained, you feel exhausted, perhaps more than you would after meetings around people in the real world. All the kids from your class on Zoom. Reckler captured our new reality in a parody children's book called Good Morning Zoom, a riff on Goodnight Moon. When I first wrote the book, we were trying to explain to our children why they were not seeing their grandparents. Here, all of these children are enduring this unbelievably terrifying experience together. Scientists say our intimacy with loved ones is really suffering. One surprisingly important thing our brains are missing out on is smell. It's the only sense that can go straight from sensory receptors directly to the cortex, the primary sensory area of the brain, making it especially powerful and informative. Smell is also linked to empathy. 
that I find so interesting and fascinating is just the idea of smell and, and that being such a big part of the way that we interact with other humans. We're getting information from people in terms of odors about, about emotions, about how they're feeling, um, and we're losing out on a lot of that. It's making us less connected in certain ways. It's a dizzying combination of effects on the human mind, and the long-term impact of all this zooming is still a mystery. We don't know the answer, but we are working pretty hard to figure it out. For now, there are ways we can limit the impact. <laughs> Ion has taken all devices out of his room and has created a set time limit with his parents for when he can use them. It was hard at first, like in the first few days, first week, but as it went by, I felt more relieved that I wasn't spending as much time on the screen. Even writing an open essay about his experience as a PSA for other kids. What are you hoping the message is from your essay? I'm hoping that it helps kids be less addicted to screen. But still, we're likely to see an awkward transition post-pandemic when we have to adapt to the next normal. Reckler hopes her children will be able to readjust. I think I need to teach my kids how to be a friend again. <laughs> teach them that it's okay to have human interaction. The good news is that the human brain, especially when young, is very resilient. With children, they're fortunate in the sense that they'll probably come out of this and be able to readapt um, again. There might be certain critical periods of development, of social and emotional development, that they miss, but I think that it'll be very quick for them to catch up with what they have lost. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Such an interesting piece. Rena, thanks for that. And that does it for this ABC News Live update. I'm Diane Macedo. Thanks for joining us. And remember, ABC News Live is here for you all day with the latest news, context, and analysis. I'll see you back here at 3 p.m. Eastern for the breakdown. Stay safe. Have a great day. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.